My dear friends, every religious tradition begins with an originary experience of God. Christianity as well begins in a sense with the Abba experience of Jesus. Jesus probably made the Abba experience when he was baptized in the river Jordan. He experienced the unconditional love of God who declared, this is my son, the beloved, my favor rests on him. And this experience was so powerful that it changed the ordinary pattern of his existence. He became now a wandering preacher, preaching the kingdom of God through his words and through his deeds. My dear friends, God had revealed himself through Moses to the people of Israel as Yahweh. But the people of Israel refrained from directly calling God by his name because they wanted to uphold the transcendence and the divinity of God. Consequent to his Abba experience, Jesus experienced God as Abba. But calling God as Abba did not merely imply some kind of familiarity with God. Calling God Abba implied a deep personal experience, a unique experience of God. In fact, there is no parallel in the Old Testament. In rabbinic literature, in intertestamental literature, in intratestamental literature. In fact, in the Old Testament, God is referred to as Father only 14 times and every time indirectly. After Jesus calls God Abba, this word is used of God no less than 140 times in the New Testament. The story is told of a Roman emperor who had won many victories and was coming back to Rome. And the people of Rome were waiting for their beloved emperor to return. And they had packed a stadium in Rome. As soon as the emperor arrived in his chariot, the people stood up as one person and applauded the arrival of their hero. Now, while this was happening, there was a little boy, about five years old, who was running down the stands, wanting to go and meet the emperor. And he was accosted by a soldier who told him, little son, you cannot go there. That is the emperor. And the little boy looked at the soldier and he said, he's your emperor and he is my emperor. But he also happens to be my father. And the little boy ran across the field, clambered up into the chariot of the emperor, sat on his father's lap and waved to the crowds. My dear friends, while God loves us with care, with compassion, tenderly, at the same time, we need to respond to this love with great reverence. This Aramaic word Abba goes back to Jesus himself and we can almost hear the authentic voice of Jesus in this word, Abba. Abba is generally translated as loving father. And Pope Francis, in his general audience, on the, 19th of, on the 16th of January 2019, stated, God is our loving father. He is also like a loving mother who cares for her children. My dear friends, this profound insight that God is Abba 
is perhaps one of the most fundamental revelations that Jesus made in the Gospels. Because since God is a loving Father, you and I can totally trust in Him, whatever the circumstances in our life. Since God is a loving Father, we can hope in His Word and we know that He will never let us down. Since God is a loving Father, we know that death is not the end, but in fact, the doorway to an eternal life with Him. Scripture points to a distinction between the way Jesus experienced God as Abba and the way His disciples experienced God as Abba. For instance, in Matthew chapter 26, verse 39, Jesus, in His agony in the Garden of Gethsemane, says, my loving Father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering away from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. However, in Matthew 6 verse 4, Jesus tells his disciples, your heavenly Father sees all that you do in secret will reward you. And in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, our Father, from this, we can infer that while Jesus experiences God as a loving Father, like any great religious teacher, Jesus deeply desires to gift this experience to his disciples. As he says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, No one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. To know in the Bible means to have a personal experience of. And so Jesus who has a personal experience of the Father and the Father's love deeply desires that his disciples similarly experience and know the Father. And so my dear friends, to be a disciple of Jesus means to gradually, with the assistance of Jesus, grow in his Abba experience. Having experienced his father's love as a distinct part of his life, Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God in word and in deed. In fact, the kingdom of God was a distinct feature of his teaching and of his preaching. And we ask ourselves, how do we understand the kingdom of God? And when you look at scripture, my dear friends, we realize there are various understandings of the kingdom of God. For instance, the kingdom of God is understood as a past, as a present, and as a future reality. For instance, in Matthew chapter 8, verse 4, Jesus says, There are many from the east and the west who will come to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob at the banquet in the kingdom of heaven. And so here, we, here we see the kingdom of God is a past reality. In Luke chapter 17 verse 29, Jesus says, The kingdom of God is in your midst. And so here the kingdom of God is presented as a present reality. And in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus prays for the kingdom, that the kingdom will eventually come. The question we ask ourselves is, how can the kingdom of God be a past, a present, and a future reality? A key to this puzzle is in this double petition in the Lord's Prayer. When Jesus prays, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And now we realize in Hebrew literature, there is the reality, the phenomenon of parallelism. And so the second part of a verse kind of explains, explicitates, develops the first part of the verse. And there are so many examples of this parallelism in the book of Psalms. For instance, Psalm 23 verse 1, the verse goes as follows, The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. And so, since the Lord is my shepherd, he sees to all my needs. My dear friends, applying this principle 
to this double petition in the Lord's Prayer, we realize that you and I experience the kingdom of God when we fulfill the will of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. When we fulfill God's will, we experience in a very tangible way the kingdom of God. And so in this way, the kingdom of God is both a past, a present, and a future reality. My dear friends, I'm sure you'll agree with me. There are moments in our lives when fulfilling the will of God, which is the most beautiful thing to do, is sometimes the most difficult thing to put into practice. And yet we know, when you and I seek to fulfill God's will in our lives, we experience the presence and the power of God that surpasses our human understanding. Let me share with you the true story of Thomas Dorsey. Thomas Dorsey was part of the Baptist Church and in the course of time as a teenager he got involved in music with the blues, blues music and there was Thomas Dorsey playing and singing in nightclubs as well as in jazz, jazz halls in Chicago and Atlanta. But even though this brought him a lot of money and fame, it left him empty. And so in the course of time, Thomas Dorsey decided once again to be an integral part of his church. He became a member of a choir. Eventually, he was directing a number of choirs. He was married to Nettie and she was in the ninth month of her pregnancy. And at this point of time, Thomas was invited to a revival meeting in St. Louis. He did not want to leave his wife, Nettie, at this time in her life. But she told him that since his name was on the billboards and he was a brilliant musician and singer, he should go. And so Thomas Dorsey went. He had sung the first song, received the applause of the people. There was Thomas Dorsey on stage when he receives the telegram. And the telegram is blunt, it is harsh. Nettie is dead. Your child has been born. She died in childbirth. Thomas is devastated. He rushes back home. He finds he has lost his wife. His baby is born. But the next day, the baby also passes away. And so Thomas buries, bo buries both his wife and his child in the same casket. His life is devastated. He does not know where to look. He does not know where to go. And then some months later, he happens to visit with his friend, Professor Fry, Annie Malone's Hall. And in this time, Thomas Dorsey is praying for God to strengthen him in this crisis in his life. And while he is at the piano, He's playing a tune, a melody that comes to his mind. And while he's playing this melody, he's repeating these words to himself, Precious Lord, lead me on. And then these words come to his mind. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Lead me on to the night, lead me on to that light. Take my hand, precious Lord lead me on. My dear friends, these were the circumstances in which Thomas Dorsey composed that beautiful song, hymn, Precious Lord. And he experienced the Lord giving him the strength to fulfill God's will in his life. My dear friends, there are so many people like Thomas Dorsey in his teenagers, teenage years, who are kind of caught up invisibly by chains. They are caught up by inordinate attachments, perhaps power, perhaps wealth, perhaps cravings. And it is only love that gives them the strength to overcome these inordinate attachments and to experience inner freedom. Jesus, through his Abba experience, which was an integral part of his life, was supremely free. 
And the freedom of Jesus is remarkable because Jesus did not possess any wealth. Jesus did not possess any religious status or social power or prestige. The authority of Jesus came from his God experience and it was this authority that came from his God experience that enabled him to challenge all that was unjust in the practice of religion as well as in society. My dear friends, Jesus gave us his commandment to love as a kind of a summary of his life and of his teachings. And we see this in Matthew chapter 22 verses 34 to 40 when a teacher of the Mosaic law confronts Jesus and he asks him which is the greatest commandment and what does Jesus do? Jesus takes Deuteronomy 6 4 which contains the great Shema, Hear O Israel and he joins it to a nondescript verse in Leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 from the Holiness Code and he puts them on par with each other. Hear O Israel, you must love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your heart, with all your mind. And together with this commandment he says, you must love your neighbor as you love yourself. And in so doing, my dear friend, Jesus teaches us that the love of God and the love of neighbor are like two sides of the same coin. The only way perhaps you and I can show our love for God concretely is to loving our neighbor. And so Jesus calls his disciples to live a life governed by love. And the word Jesus uses for love is agape. It is a very specific New Testament term that stands for selfless and sacrificial love. My dear friends, in the Sermon on the Plains, Jesus reminds us that you and I, as disciples of His, need to love like this. And it is only this kind of agape love that reaches out to the undeserving, to the unrewarding, to the hostile. I'd like to relate a true story from the life of Father Flanagan, who started Boy's Town and who teaches us the miracle of agape love. One day, Father Flanagan was told of a boy who was to be admitted to his home. This boy, like all, like all the other boys in Father Flanagan's homes, was a boy who was picked up from the streets. What was very unique about this boy was, and very sad, was that he had murdered both his parents. And so Father Flanagan waited for this boy with fear and trepidation. The boy came to the home. Father Flanagan welcomed him, showed him around. Two years later, believe it or not, this boy was the head boy of that home. And while he was talking to Father Flanagan, he told him, Father, if you so much as scolded me, the next person I would murder would be you. But you looked at me with eyes of compassion and love, and I felt a new life being born within me. And so the Abba experience of Jesus and the commandment to love are two fundamental truths in the gospel which have a tremendous relevance for the world today, especially in these trying times of the pandemic. Because in Jesus, we see the great indicative that is God is Abba. He is a loving father who has an unconditional love for each and every one of us. In Jesus, we also see the great imperative that God invites us to love those in need. And that the only way you and I can show our love for God is by loving those who are in need. And so, the Christian Marga may be described as the Agape Marga, the way of selfless and sacrificial love. My dear friends, it was to this Abba experience of Jesus that sustained him through his life and mission that brought him at the end of his life to surrender, to abandon himself into the provident hands of God. The same love 
the same love of the Father invites you and me, all of us, to surrender our lives, to abandon ourselves totally into the provident hands of God at all times. Because only in so doing, you and I experience a life that this world cannot give. I'd like to conclude with the prayer of abandonment by Brother Charles of Jesus. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me and in all your creatures. I wish no more than this, O Lord. Into your hands I commend my soul. I offer it to you with all the love of my heart. For I love you, Lord, and so need to give myself, to surrender myself into your hands without reserve and with boundless confidence, for you are my Father. Good evening, my dear friends. I welcome you to this evening prayer service. We have just listened to the talk by Father Gilbert de Lima on the Abba experience. Let us ask for this grace that when we pray, we too may have the Abba experience like Jesus had when he prayed. Let us begin by signing ourselves in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great is your name, Lord, its majesty fills the When I see the heaven, the work of your hands The moon and the stars which you arranged What is man that you keep him in mind? Mortal man that you care for him Great is your name, Lord its majesty fills the earth. Give glory to the Father Almighty, to His Son, Jesus Christ the Lord, to the Spirit who dwells in our hearts, both now forever. Amen. Great is your name, Lord. Its majesty fills the earth. Let us now listen to the words of Scripture. Gospel of Luke chapter 10 verse 22 All things have been handed over to me by my Father and no one knows who the Son is except the Father or who the Father is except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Jesus tells us that he had an intimate fellowship with the Father, a serene relationship with God. The warmth and intimacy he had was of a son towards his father. Abba is the way a child addresses his or her father, like daddy. The word Abba means not simply father, but expresses a degree 
of intimate familiarity that no one previously had ventured to presume. But he really knew his God. Jesus could dare to call him Abba. Jesus also wanted his disciples to know God as Father, just as he did. Hence, in Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer, we read, When you pray, say, Father, Abba. When we say that God is a Father, we don't limit ourselves to a masculine concept of God. We know that in the Bible, God is compared more than once to a mother who takes care of her children with tender love. To call, to call God our Father is to recognize in him the one from who all that is good, all that is perfect is seen. It is Jesus himself who teaches us to invoke him as our Father. Since Jesus tells us that, not, that only he can reveal the Father to those whom he chooses in order to have an experience of God as Abba, we first need to have an intimate relationship with Jesus. In the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 12, we read, But to all those who did receive him, who placed their trust in his name, he gave the power to become children of God. Believing in Jesus, believing in his name, he gives us the power to be called children of God. And again, in John chapter 14, verse 6, we read, No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the sure way to have an Abba experience. We need to have an intimate relationship with Jesus in order to have an Abba experience. Finally, through our baptism, we have received the Holy Spirit. And St. Paul tells us in Romans 8, 14 to 15, that the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. Through our baptism, we have become adopted children of God. And from that, we have received the grace to call God our Father. In Galatians 4.4, 4, we read, And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so you are no longer slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir to God. Because of Jesus, we have been made heirs to the kingdom. We have given the grace to call God our Father. What a great gift we have received through Jesus. Having an intimate relationship with him will help us also to have the Abba experience. God gives us his spirit and it is through his spirit, the spirit of Jesus, that we are able to acknowledge and call God Abba. I now invite you to close your eyes and to become aware of God as our Father. Let us recall the words of scripture which we have just heard. 
No one can come to the Father except through me. What is my relationship with Jesus? Only Jesus can reveal the Father to us. Through his Spirit, we have all received the grace to call him Abba. As we remain silent with our eyes closed, let us reflect on these words that I read. Abba, Father, you are my Father, and I am your child. I believe that you are a Father to me at every moment of my life. I believe that, you love, that your love for me is infinite and that you watch over me night and day and even the hair on my head are counted. I believe in your infinite power. You can bring good even out of evil Abba, Father, I want to surrender myself to you as a baby does in a mother's arms. You know me better than I know myself. My Father, since it is your wish that we should always turn to you, I come with confidence to ask, together with Jesus and Mary, an abundance in faith, an abundance in love, an abundance in courage, wisdom, understanding, and all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I pray very specially for your protection in my life. Abba, Father, call all human beings to yourself. Let all the world proclaim your fatherly goodness and divine mercy. Be a tender father to me and protect me wherever I am, like the apple of your eye. Make me always a worthy son or daughter. Have mercy on me. Divine Father, sweet hope of our souls, may you be known, honored, and loved by all people. Let us gently open our eyes. Let us thank God that through his Son we have become his children. Like Jesus, we too can dare to call him Father because we have been given this power by Jesus because we believe in him. He has put his spirit into our hearts that gives us that grace to call him a father. With gratitude in our hearts for so great a gift, let us say the very prayer that Jesus has taught us, slowly becoming aware that we are praying to our father our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great indeed are your works, O Lord, now and evermore. Great indeed are your works, O Lord, now and evermore. The universe night and day tells of all your wonders. You are our life and our light. We shall praise you always. Great indeed are your works, O Lord, now and evermore. Great indeed are your works, O Lord, now and evermore.